Okay, we're going to jump right in. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priscilla Calvache. I'm the Assistant Director for Lupus Programs and Community Engagement <clears throat> at Hospital for Special Surgery. And on behalf of the Department of Medicine and the Department of Social Work Programs at HSS, we're excited to welcome everyone to our first program to kick off our Lupus Awareness Month lineup for 2022. The Department of Social Work Programs at Hospital for Special Surgery offers the most lupus support and education programs in the country. Our programs are all free and available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And for more information about our support programs and the Department of Medicine at HSS, we encourage you to visit our websites, and these have been included in our chat box. So today we are joined by Dr. Andy Miller, who will be leading an interactive conversation on COVID-19 updates, access to treatment options, and boosters for the lupus community. And before we get started, I would like to begin with just a free few brief housekeeping roles. Participants are going to be muted during the presentation, but we're highly encouraging your participation by sharing your comments and your questions in the chat box throughout uh, today's talk. We will have time to review your questions, any additional questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and Dr. Miller will also be addressing questions that were submitted during registration during his presentation. Lastly, I would also like to introduce our program evaluation your feedback is incredibly important to us and really helps us to inform our future programs. So we will be embedding the survey link in the chat box. And we kindly ask that you complete this brief survey at the conclusion of today's program. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Trisha Doherty, who is the Senior Director of Nursing for the Department of Medicine at HSS. And she will be introducing our speaker this afternoon. Welcome, Trisha. Well, thank you so much, Priscilla, and welcome every, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today and to present uh, Dr. Andy Miller. Um, he's one of our favorites here, so I, I'd like to say that. <laughs> so um, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Miller. So Dr. Miller uh, started his career. Um, he's an associate attending physician and um, chief, of infectious, chief of infectious disease, which is actually uh, just a huge promotion for, for Dr. Miller this year. Um, and Really, he got us to that point because um, we've really, he's done a remarkable job uh, with the, a COVID-19 effort. So we're really happy to have him here today. Um, he's actually also an associate professor at Wild Cornell uh, Medical College. He graduated from uh, Yale and then received his MD degree at Harvard uh, Medical School. He trained in um, internal medicine and is also infectious disease at NYU and Columbia Presbyterian. Um, so before coming to HSS in 2010, Dr. Miller was an infectious disease specialist at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. Um, at HSS, he sees patients with all sorts of issues related to infectious disease, um, helping them to prevent infections and to treat them. He collaborates in clinical research studies uh, to prevent and treat infections in patients with rheumatologic diseases and surgical infections in orthopedic patients. Um, since the start of uh, COVID-19 um, epidemic, Dr. Miller has also helped to take care of patients with COVID-19, and we're very grateful for that. He's been part of um, very a lot of different teams within the hospital, making sure HSS is keep running efficiently and safely and trying to keep patients and staff safe and visitors. Um, so I'm really excited to turn it over to our speaker this afternoon and welcome Dr. Miller. Thank you, Trisha. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, you know, teams are important, and, and uh, you should know that Trisha Doherty is really important on our teams, too, and making sure that all the, the patients who come uh, to HSS for outpatient care stay really safe, and, and she does so much behind the scenes, you have no idea. So thank you for that nice introduction, um, and I think I'm going to jump right into the slides. Hi, everybody. I know some people, I'm sure, but um, let me find my slides here. Where did they go? Oh, here they are. This is the, what am I doing here? Hold on, I've done something wrong. Oh my, here we go. Screen two. Okay. Something happened. This is in anticipation of the great slides ahead. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I thought I'd have it. I thought I was, I thought I was good at this. Okay. Hi, everybody. I hope uh, you can see my slides now. It's okay. Yes. All right. Good. All right. So um, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about COVID-19 and people um, who are living with lupus. 
And um, just, you know, in, in, in terms of our medical talks, when we give talks, we always talk about disclosures. Is anybody paying me? Do I work for any companies? And the answer is no, I work for HSS. And that's where, that's who, that's the only person I, uh, the only group I work for. Um, and the people who have really taught me and, and help me every day are really the hospital for special surgery, and particularly the D Department of Medicine, and across the street at my colleagues in infectious disease at New York Presbyterian across the street also have been fantastic throughout the pandemic, and not only taking care of patients, but really moving the world forward in terms of our understanding of how to take care of COVID. And my patients and my family also, and this is, it's, um, it's an honor to get to work here and, and to meet all of you and, and uh, just to be in New York. I want to bring up this idea of humility too. Um, people on this call, you many of you know a lot about COVID, whether you know it, when, whether you like it or not. There's so many studies, many studies that contradict each other. There's so much to learn and almost impossible, or it is impossible to get through all of the literature now. And every month it seems to change. Uh, you know, first we have one kind of virus, and now there are variants. There were no treatments, and then there were treatments. There are vaccines, and then boosters, and it's always changing very tricky uh, landscape. And so here's a landscape that's been changing, as I just said, prior immunity. So have you had COVID before? Have you been vaccinated or boosted? Now we have treatments that we didn't have before. There are always the new variants. And the other piece is society and trust. And I want to bring that up because I know at least one of my patients with lupus, who I saw, I don't know if she's on the call right now, but she was there with a family member a couple of days ago and they were really doubting whether or not they needed a booster. And it wasn't because of the medical stuff, it's because of trust. Do you trust the science? Do you trust the government? Do you trust doctors? And all of these questions are much deeper than COVID, but they sure have come to the surface during these years. So I think it's important just to talk to patients and have that in mind that not, not everything we say as doctors sounds right to patients and you have to listen and, 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 and address those issues. This was two years ago, May 24th, 2020, 100,000 people had died in this country from COVID. And this is this week. This week, according to at least NBC News, we hit the 1 million American deaths mark. It's almost surely an undercount of the total number of people who died. And around the world, it's the, the published number is 6 million, but some people say it's well above 20 million uh, people who have died. We don't know for sure just an amazing amount of damage to humanity, to society, um, to social networks, um, all sorts of things have happened because of this virus. A lot of you have, whether you know it or not, a lot of us already have had COVID-19. This is really important to remember. Maybe you know you had it, maybe you don't know, but if you look across the country, and these are surveys that the CDC does just of people, cross-sectional surveys of people and whether or not they have the antibodies uh, from having the infection itself. And more than 50% of Americans have had it already. In fact, if you look at, Amer uh, at kids up here at this time, February, 2022, 75% of kids across the country had antibodies to COVID. And these are not the antibodies you get from a vaccine. These are from the, the infection itself. The more vaccinated, the population is like these are the older people here along this curve and they they go outside somewhat less and they have the vaccine much more than kids do they're less likely to have been infected but still a third of senior citizens have had covid already these are the questions we'll get to at the end from you and i will try to hit every single box we'll see if we get there and if we have time after this which i hope we do i'll have time um, and other questions come up i hope you'll ask me those questions we'll see where we get all right, so many of the people on this call are living with lupus. And here, when, when I write RMD, I'm talking about rheumatoid and musculoskeletal disease, which really does, rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease, which does include lupus. I'm talking about lupus here. And it's just some basic questions. Do patients with lupus have a higher risk of just getting COVID? The answer looks like it's yes, they do. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Do they have a higher risk of poor outcomes, of getting hospitalized, of getting intubated of dying if they get infected? The answer is maybe. There's a lot of mixed data on it, but the sicker you are, if you have, sometimes people have lupus and they've got other problems, diabetes, uh, 
advanced, you know, a high high body weight, et cetera. All of those things can contribute. It's not always just the lupus. Are there different symptoms that people get if they've got lupus and they get COVID? Not really. Do flares become more likely if you get COVID? It's really interesting. We were all worried about it. One of the studies suggests maybe, but not really. That hasn't been shown. Some people do flare, but it's not really clear they get flare more often than usual. Do they get secondary infections? For instance, some people have been getting fungal infections after COVID. No, people with lupus don't seem to get them more than average, but it depends on how sick they are already. Are they able to clear the infection to get rid of the, the virus? And the answer is there's no data that they can't get rid of the virus. But again, the more immunosuppression is on board, the harder it is for the body to get rid of the virus. And then is there anything that you need to do after people get uh, infected? Really, the answer is no. So we'll go into some of these questions a little bit in a minute. One of the big groups of doctors that got together to share their patients' data in an ethical way and look at how rheumatology patients did during the pandemic was called uh, the, the Global Rheumatology Alliance. And they published article after article looking at their patients in different ways. And so one study looked at hospitalization among patients with rheumatic diseases was much more likely if the patients were old, if they had other problems with their rheumatic disease, as I said, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, and if they had a high steroid dose above 10 milligrams. And you've heard, I'm sure, if those of you who have taken prednisone, your rheumatologist fretting about how much they're giving and the hope that they can decrease because corticosteroids just increase the risk of all sorts of complications, including infections. So in general, we want to minimize that number to the lowest possible. Hospi in a, in a, when they looked at these patients by race, they saw that white patients tended to be hospitalized less and non-white patients more for the same COVID-19 virus. The severity of disease or whether or not patients needed intubation or needed to be transferred to the ICU went up if they were on rituxan and one of the JAK inhibitors, the, the medicines that end in tisanib, right? Um, and patients who weren't on these medications tended to do a little bit better. And then in terms of mortality, who died? Well, people who are older, sicker, on rituxan, for some reason on sulfasalazine that they couldn't figure out, and I'm not sure I believe that. People who are on higher doses of steroids and people who had active lupus that where they got COVID while they're in the middle of a flare, those people tended to do worse, which is not that surprising. They are sicker people. Rituxan is the big one, and I don't know how many patients how many people on this call are on it. It's a wonderful medicine for controlling uh, several kinds of immune diseases, including lupus. But unfortunately, if you're on rituxan or the medicines like it that get rid of B cells, it really seems to affect your, uh, the trouble you have when you get COVID. You can see here, any, any of these lines that cross this dotted line, there was no significant difference in risk. But when you get to rituxan with patients with a rheumatologic condition or rituxan given for cancer, these lines are way over here, suggesting people were substantially likelier to die from COVID-19. So that's a medicine that's had a lot of attention during, and, and a family of medicines, all of these B cell depletion medicines that have had a lot of attention during COVID. And if you're on it, talk to your doctor about, are there uh, other options? Often there aren't, you're on it. You know, people are given that for lupus, not as the first line, but maybe as the second, third, or fourth line treatment. And if it's working, the rheumatologist may not want to change it. I hope that most of you are vaccinated. I'm sure that not everyone is. This was one of the slides that I remember the most vividly um, from the COVID epidemic is this was the first slide from the New England Journal showing the efficacy of just one dose of the Pfizer vaccine. People in the blue line here were people who did not get the vaccine. And you can see every day, every day, one person, another person, another person, another person, another person, another person getting COVID all the way up. And it was linear. Every day people were getting the study who hadn't gotten vaccinated were getting COVID. But along the red line, people who had gotten vaccine on day zero here, they still got COVID for the first 10 days, but quickly they stopped getting COVID. One got one here, one here, 
then a few days later, another one, but the rates were so much lower. And this incredible distance between these lines, we realized that we had an incredibly potent um, vaccine. You know, there have been worries that maybe the vaccine doesn't last so long, or maybe it has some side effects or toxicities, but this curve was critical uh, to me and to many people at showing how effective it is at simply preventing infections. It's gone on, we know that not only does it prevent infection, but it makes the infections when you get them a lot better, a lot easier to withstand, right? It modulates the course I wrote. That's a nerdy way of saying it makes things better. You're much less likely to go to the hospital. You're much, much less likely to die if you've had a vaccine. And then we think it really decreased the spread a lot simply by decreasing uh, infections and then uh, speeding up recovery afterwards. The other piece of it is that we worried about its safety. And at this point, um, I don't remember the number, but it's more than a billion people who have been vaccinated with these vaccines, one billion. And it's remarkable how safe it's proving to be. So there have been concerns about neurologic problems like Guillain-Barre syndrome, autoimmune problems, flares of all sorts of diseases that have been worries. And really, there's almost nothing. Some rare patients will be allergic to it. But really, these are remarkably safe vaccines. And I, I will say that again and again. I think we can skip this, but you'll just remember that depending, this is, this is sort of a very simplified schematic of what the immune system is, right? You've got, you can give your vaccine, it goes, the fact when you give the vaccine, the antigen from the vaccine is picked up by a cell called the dendritic cell. And then you either make B cell responses like antibodies or T cell responses from different kinds of white cells. And the different medicines that you're on, many of them for lupus, including steroids, right, glucocorticoids, including um, rituxam, have direct effects on these different types of cells. And that's why they work, because you have either B cell responses that are, that are attacking your own body or sometimes T cell responses, and you give, need to give those medicines to break those. So when you do that, you also affect the way that these cells can process the vaccine. And that's why the vaccine may not work so well or as well in certain uh, groups of patients on these medicines. So when we measure whether a vaccine works, we look at B cell immunity. That's B cell immunity is that you have antibodies uh, to, the, to the virus or to the, to the spike protein. T cell immunity, which is hard to do, but you can do it in research labs and see how T cells have learned about this virus. It's really important, not in so much in getting the infection, but it prevents severe infections if you've got good T cell immunity to the virus. But the most important thing is, does it work? So they look at how, whether people who got vaccines are less likely to end up at the hospital or less likely to die. This is what I really care about as a, as a doctor who sees patients and safety. Okay, so I don't want to have a, a very good vaccine that also makes people sick. It gets complicated, but we can see that the more immunocompromised, the sicker you are, the, the less good an immune system you, you, you have, the less likely you are to make antibodies. But it's not so bad for people with lupus. And I'll tell you why. Here is, they had 1, 1,200 people in this study. And the people who were just nurses and doctors who didn't have medical issues, 92% of them, you could measure their vaccine, their, their antibody after they got the vaccine, 92%. If you looked at people, SOT is solid organ transplant, only 30% of them could have had a vaccine because they are very immunocompromised. And then if you go all the way down, let's skip down to autoimmune, including lupus, 79%. So that's the 79% isn't as good as perfect, right? 92, but it's pretty good. And it's much better than other kinds of immunocompromise. However, again, people on these medicines, rituxan and the other medicines that decrease B cells, you went down to 18%. So that is the, that's the caveat. That's the medicine that really changes your COVID risk. This is, an, again, in people who really have um, uh, affected immune systems, solid organ transplant recipients. If you just gave them vaccine, these are, the, these are the people who got infected. And if you didn't give them vaccine, they got infected far more. All right, so you can see a change of about 80, a protection of 81% uh, in the people with the weakest immune systems from the vaccine. So even though you, your, your immune system may not be perfect, 
there's still a very potent effect of this vaccine. It's very protective. Uh, I'll just, I don't have, I can, uh, I'll, this is the same thing. It just shows that hospitalization also, even in people with rheumatologic illness like lupus, the vaccine really works. Is it safe in lupus? So you may remember from the years before COVID, if you had lupus at that time, that people were worried about giving you non-live vaccines. You couldn't get the MMR. You couldn't get the, one of the zoster vaccines that prevented shingles because it had a living virus, but that the other ones you could get. And what we knew about those is they're pretty safe for people with lupus, right? The, the flu shot, pneumovax, the childhood vaccines. People with lupus generally do fine. Flares happen sometimes, but not so much. Fortunately, that seems to be the case uh, with the COVID vaccines too. So there, these are three studies, one of which is, was done at HSS. So I don't know if you know Dr. Barbaya, but she was the lead author in this study, where they basically went and asked lupus patients after they got vaccinated whether they had flares. So here's one from NYU down the street from us, where about 11% flared, but all of those were mild flares. One person in the, out of 90 had something they, qual they, they said was a severe flare. Here was 700 patients done somewhere else, I'm not sure exactly where, where 3% of them flared. And then in 1,100 patients with lupus that were, took a web survey uh, out, of, out of HSS, they had a 9% flare, but nobody who got very sick. So some people needed a little bit more steroid, somebody had mild flare afterwards. But again, a clear clinical benefit because you're not getting COVID nearly as much. I don't know how many people have heard of this medicine. It's called Ebusheld, and I wanted to mention it. I wanted to mention it for the people right now, specifically who are on rituxan, but also for anyone who's on immunosuppressive therapy, who's worried that the vaccine might not have worked as well as we want it to. Uh, and that might be people on biologics, people on high doses of steroids, because I think it'll become much more available at HSS. This is a medicine. It's a monoclon two monoclonal antibodies. You can get, uh, you can get, we do have it here at HSS. One injection in your left buttock, one injection in your right buttock at the same time. And if you get those injections, you're actually protected, uh, quite well protected against COVID for about six months, maybe more, we're not sure. We've been giving it to the people who really need it, the people on rituxan, people with transplants, people with cancers. Um, but now that we have many of the people, many of those people who have already gotten it, the ones that want it have gotten it, um, we're opening up, I think, soon to a much broader group of people. So I certainly ask your rheumatologist if you're interested in learning more about this medicine. You'd come into HSS um, or, and, and if I should mention, I know that some of the people on this call are not from HSS, you should certainly ask your rheumatologist where uh, you could get uh, this medicine too. But it's really interesting um, as a prevention, uh, because what it is, is uh, uh, basically two anti-spike antibodies. So it's giving you the antibodies you might not have made uh, from getting the vaccine if your immune system isn't up to it. All right. If you get COVID, what do you do? So many people nowadays with the current Omicron um, virus are getting very mild symptoms. Just some people end up getting sick. It can be a nasty illness, even if you don't need to go to the hospital. As many of you know, it can be like the flu, sometimes worse than the flu. And then once in a while, people do still need to go to the hospital. We're seeing an increase in New York State in hospitalizations. So what do we do for outpatient treatment of COVID-19? This is right out of the uh, national recommendations for treatment. And if a patient does not require hospitalization or supplemental oxygen, we're talking about people at home who get sick, they go get tested, uh-oh, I've got COVID. You should really talk to your doctor about starting one of these treatments. And I say that because the people on this call probably do have somewhat affected immune systems from lupus. And that can really, you know, probably make things a little bit worse. And I'm pretty much for treatment. The preferred therapies, the main one is Paxlovid. It's a five-day course of treatment. You can get it in New York City simply from a, a centralized pharmacy. It's much easier to get right now. We can talk about that in the question and answer period, but it's out there. 
but you have to watch out because it does have some medication side effects that you need to watch out for. Remdesivir was that first antiviral. It's hard to get as an outpatient because you need to come into the infusion center three days in a row for it, and nobody wants to do that. So it's become hard to, impractical to do. And then out of all those monoclonal antibodies that was people were talking about, Regeneron and all of those other ones, there's only one left that we know or we believe really works, and that's Bevtilovimab. And so that's become another option. This other pill I actually don't recommend. It's there and it's available. We don't know how well it works. All of this other stuff is really talking about what happens uh, for, for patients who have been in the hospital or the emergency room. We're not going to talk about that right now. So that's the landscape. I'm curious to see what other questions have come up. And these are the questions that came in. I wanted to go through them if that's okay. And, uh, and I hope you are finding this helpful. So I'm just going to go right down the list if that's okay. What's the data regarding long haul COVID in the lupus population? So um, long haul COVID means, uh, and this unfortunately is happening, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to define exactly what it means. It means a lot of things, but some people get COVID and they just don't get better. It's not that the fever persists and it's not that they're coughing nonstop, but they feel terrible. They can have sort of an inflammation, uh, aches and pains, sensory symptoms, mental issues. And it's actually been hard for researchers and scientists to really pin down exactly how to define it because it's so many different symptoms. I looked when I got this question um, at how much loop, how much study, how many people have actually looked at the incidence of long haul COVID in lupus. I don't see that anybody's really studied it yet. What it does look like is that some, some, some researchers, researchers anyway, think that long haul COVID patients often have autoantibodies. So I'm a little worried about this actually, because obviously lupus patients also have autoantibodies and autoimmunity. So I think there's more to learn and I'm not gonna tell you that I know anything right, right now. There's really little to learn about, uh, really, not, little to read about it right now. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll have studies coming. Are people with lupus at greater risk of getting long COVID? Again, I don't think we know that. We just, we haven't seen yet. I worry that they might be, but a lot of normal people with, uh, not the, I shouldn't say normal, a lot of people without COVID uh, also um, are not, uh, are, are also are getting long COVID. Um, with relaxed mandates for masks indoors, should vaccinated lupus patients be advised to continue to wear masks? If you are on the subway train, or if you are in a crowded room, or you are in a conference center, you should wear masks. I think the people around you should wear masks. I think that they work. I think the vaccines are the most important thing, but if you have an impaired immune system, you should take all the steps available to avoid getting COVID because it can be awful. So yeah, I'm not so relaxed and I'm, uh, as you can, you might imagine, not ex very excited about all the people I see, particularly in indoor spaces who have taken off their masks and seem to have forgotten what we just lived through over the last two years. Is hydroxychloroquine uh, protecting lupus? Oh, so this was the question about hydroxychloroquine and whether it protects lupus from severe COVID outcomes. And I'm gonna tell you my opinion. And my opinion is based on a lot of data that I've seen. And I don't think hydroxychloroquine protects lupus patients from severe COVID outcomes. You may be on hydroxychloroquine and it might be really important for your lupus, so don't stop it. But I don't think it does so much. None of the studies are that exciting that show that, that it has a big effect on, on, uh, on COVID. How about methotrexate? There's mixed data on methotrexate and whether you're more vulnerable, but I told you rituxan is the big one. So that's the one where I, I worry about the vulnerability. Uh, can COVID infections cause lupus flares we talked about? Not much, not often. And when they do, they didn't seem severe. Uh, due to its prophylactic value for CVD, for COVID, should SLE patients stay on hydroxychloroquine forever if their retinas are okay? So as I said, um, you can stay on hydroxychloroquine for your lupus, but don't stay on hydroxychloroquine just because of COVID, because I don't think it does much. How do we prepare for a future with COVID? This is a good question. Um, I, think, I think that 
one thing that experts have been every time they purport to um, know what's going to happen next is they're guessing and we don't know what's going to happen. I don't think it's likely that a terrible killer virus worse than the one in 2020 is around the corner right now. I, I really don't. But, you know, COVID is not over and concerns for COVID are not over. And I think it's, I am very confident that there will be more, more, you know, surges coming. And so I think as we prepare for a future, you need to keep on reading the news, the, the, at least the news items you trust and keeping informed including talking to your doctor. Um, I do think that for now, I am not planning to go to any packed nightclubs uh, or anything like that where people are really packed together. That's, you know, I, I, I know that it's important to be human and see family and see friends and meet new people, but we need to find safer ways of doing it than, than really close packed. And so I wear masks most of the places I go. What do I suggest as best safe practices for returning to in-person work? I think that that sort of covers it. In-person work is, is good. And at least if, 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 if you need to go back or you want to go back, that's fine. But mitigating strategies, like not necessarily sharing a room with eight people, finding a way to face away rather than towards uh, other people, having, you know, trying to have people cough away from you. And most importantly, ventilation, right? And if you're working indoors in an office space, make sure the building has good ventilation. And there's a lot you can read about that on, on the internet, but basically closed air, stagnant air, uh, people without masks, that's what drives up, uh, drives up uh, the transmission of COVID. And stay vaccinated, as I said. These are questions about the booster shots. Is it safe with lupus to get a fourth booster shot? So First of all, I think it's important if you haven't had a booster, I didn't talk about this in my slides. If you hadn't had a, had a booster yet, get one. If you've already had, and, and the reason why is I think it's important. It really helps boost the number of antibodies, boost the T cell immunity and decreases uh, COVID. How about that fourth booster, right? That the second booster shot they're telling you about. That's a trickier question. And a lot of people are, a lot of doctors are not so sure what they think about this shot. How long will it work? Is it important? Is it really, how important is it gonna be in the fall if we have new variants coming? So there's a lot of doubt about it and a lot of people aren't that excited. I'd say that if your immune system is very affected by, by lupus, you should think about Epusheld. If you are completely healthy and you have, and you're exactly 50 years old and you just qualified to get the second booster shot, it's probably okay to wait. But I'll bet that most of you on this call are somewhere in the middle and you're struggling with this question, just like your doctors are. Talk to your doctor. I think it's safe. I don't think there's anything wrong with getting the booster, but some people want to wait a little longer and it's not clear that everybody has to rush and get it now. Can the boosters cause lupus flares? Not shown. I don't think so. I got COVID and was given an infusion treatment. Do I still need to take the third booster shot? I'm not sure what infusion you got you should have a booster shot. Timing of that booster shot, you could talk about with your doctor because I'm not sure exactly what infusion you're talking about here. Uh, should lupus patients get the second booster shot? We talked about that just now. Uh, I had the J&J, &J, oh, this was a good one. I had the J&J &J vaccine and booster. When is the additional shot becoming available for J&J? &J? I don't want to mix technology. Um, if you are sure you don't want to mix technology, then I don't know the answer because there is no additional booster shot for J&J. &J. But think about it. Right now we know that J&J &J didn't quite work as well as the mRNA vaccines. And there have been plenty of studies, again, not millions of people, but thousands of people in the studies that have gotten J&J &J and then went on to get boosters with other vaccines, uh, the mRNA vaccines, and they're fine. So what I want you to do is reconsider that statement, of whoever asked this question, about not wanting to mix technology, because I think that that's a natural thought, but I think there's a real benefit in going and getting a good vaccine with mRNA, okay? Lastly, last column is, what treatments are available for mild to moderate lupus patients with COVID? I think we talked about that. If you're sick at home with COVID and you've got um, lupus and you're on a little bit of steroid and some hydroxychloroquine, you're, you're, you're worried and symptomatic and coughing, you call your doctor, rheumatologist or otherwise, and I think you give your, get yourself Paxlovid. 
but you need to be careful again about some of the interactions there. Question, why are there so many barriers to access COVID treatments? It's a, it's a great question. Um, there, you know, what, what tends to happen as these things come out uh, in the middle of flares with, you know, we get a, the New York state gets a small amount that's allocated to, you know, three pharmacies or five hospitals. And so it seems like there's barriers. At this time, Paxlovid is pretty easy to get. So hopefully the barriers to that medicine have gone down. It's been complicated. Some of the monoclonal antibodies have to be given by nurses in infusion centers, but uh, there are only so many rooms and beds uh, available in hours in the day. And so they have a lot of problems with throughput with their capacity. Um, as you, uh, are we as lupus patients able to gain access somehow, you know, through your rheumatologist, but I don't, I don't know of any, unfortunately, lupus license that, 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 that gets you uh, through quicker. Should you, uh, we talked about monoclonal antibodies. Uh, is some lupus patients should get monoclonal antibody, the Evusheld one I discussed. Are the antiviral drugs working? Yeah, I'd say yes. Paxlovid and remdesivir seem to decrease death. There are some concerns about Paxlovid. Does it really kill the virus or does it just defer? But in general, it's been shown to really help people stay out of the hospital. So yeah. Um, I got COVID in March, I think March of 2020 is what you mean, uh, with big lung issues, and then Omicron in February of 2022 with continued itchy skin. Any advice, treatment, or wisdom? So um, yeah, this is a good example of somebody, unfortunately, getting COVID once does not prevent the second infection, and people can get it third and fourth times, too. The good news is that severity tends to be lower. Uh, so it's there are cases, but they're very rare of people who died or got very sick the second or third time because your immune system already knows something about the virus and is probably able to fight it off a little bit better. So for the person who's writing this, I do suggest uh, making sure you're still vaccinated. Um, and depending on what sort of immune system and medications you're on, maybe getting the preventative antibody as well, uh, the Evusheld. And finally, how many times have I said Evusheld? It is a good option, I like it for qualifying patients. And we're trying to figure out what our supply is, who should get it. And I don't think it's for everyone because if you responded well to the vaccine, there's no reason to get it. But if you didn't respond well to the vaccine, if there's concerns that, it, that, that maybe you don't make antibodies as well as the next guy, then maybe uh, you talk about it. I don't know what's gonna happen over the summer in terms of new vi vaccines coming out, but there are all sorts of fascinating ideas. And one of the best ideas is a vaccine that would kill all coronaviruses, not just COVID, you know, SARS-CoV-2, this virus, but all of the other ones. Um, so that would really hopefully prevent variants from coming out because it would just, it would be like a, you know, all, all of the, you know, all of the possible mutants uh, we would be immune to. Is that ever gonna happen? I don't know, but that's the dream. And it would be great to have a flu vaccine like that too, so we didn't have to keep on getting vaccinated against each variant of flu every year as well. And just as a quick thing, yes, you should get your flu shot next year. So I think those are the questions that were asked. I think I, I, I answered them. I'm really curious to see what came up in the chat and what questions come up. So I'm gonna turn, should I turn off my screen at this point? Sure, thank sharing. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Sure, you can stop screen sharing. Right, so on. again, I just want to thank you for this comprehensive presentation. So we're going to turn over to our Q&A portion of the program. Just a friendly reminder, I see several questions have come in, just to please use the chat box to submit any additional questions. Um, and we're going to begin with a few of the live questions that came in. So Dr. Miller, a few participants are still asking if you can clarify um, if there is a need for the third and fourth booster. I know you covered that a little bit. Um, some of them missed that, so they were just like a little bit more uh, insight into that. Totally. So I, I, you, you may have missed it because I sort of got vague, right? I wasn't totally clear. So the third booster, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Get the third. The fourth booster, I'm going to say probably. Okay. I happen to be, um, you know, some of my friends who are 50 and have no medical history and they just became, they just qualified for the booster. Uh, they're going to wait. Okay. And somebody, if you were very old and very sick, um, then you should probably get the booster. I think for a lot of people with lupus who do qualify, 
it's, you're in the middle because we don't know whether to wait a little bit or go for it. But if you, you need to talk to your rheumatologist and in general, we're talking about that second booth or the fourth dose in general, I'd say you, you can get it and you probably should, but it's a question worth talking about and reading about. And it depends on you specifically. Great, thank Here's you. That. I just wanna follow that up um, with, is, you, is Uvochelle used in place of the second booster? Uh, it can't, that's a great question. We would probably give it, you can talk to your rheumatologist about that. We would probably give it in place of the second booster, but you can certainly get both. If you're gonna get both in general, get the booster first, okay? Get the booster first, give it a couple of weeks to have you, for, so your immune system can respond however well it will, and then go get the, um, the Evusheld, because the Evusheld, because it's the antibody, actually may prevent the vaccine from doing very much. It may not be as, it may, it may be less, it may stimulate your immune system somewhat less. Yeah, when we actually currently give it at um, HSS, we actually tell our patients to get the booster first, then wait about at least two weeks to make sure just exactly what Dr. Miller said. Right. Um, to make but, sure you have that effect. Yeah, if your doctor doesn't think you respond to the vaccine at all, then there may not be a whole, there may not be a real need to get that booster. Maybe it's just time to get the Evusheld. So talk to your rheumatologist about it. Great, and another question just to follow up to that came in um, before we, we change uh, topics. It says, what was meant by the third booster? Do you mean the third shot? Yeah, so that, thank you for clarifying that. That's a perfect, so some people got, and, they, and, and rightfully so, three shots as they're part of their primary series. So I'm talking about the first booster. Should you get a booster? And the answer is yes, you should get a booster. Should you get a second booster? And I'm saying probably. If you qualify for the second booster, you should probably get it. But there are cases where people want to wait and it makes sense to wait and you can talk to your doctor, okay? Thank you. So we have some other questions that came in um, just about risk of rituximab. Does belimumab have similar risk as rituximab? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, but there are fewer people on it and there's less research on it. And uh, we have another question that came in. How long after recovering from COVID should you get the booster? Um, well, so um, among people with lupus um, who might not make so much antibody afterwards, I don't think there's a great need to wait. So, you know, in the beginning, we weren't sure, you know, was it safe to give the booster right after uh, an, an infection? I'd say within three months, you should get the booster, okay? Within three months of your vaccine, sorry, within three months of your COVID-19 infection, you should get that booster. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. So we have some great questions that are coming in um, referencing um, Plaxlovid, which you mentioned was easy to get. What are some of the steps that we would need to take to get it? All right, so I'm not actually sure among people on this call who's in New York City and who's not. With If you're in New York, it's easy to get, and this is the way to do it. Your doctor writes the prescription and sends it to Alto Pharmacy. That's it. Alto Pharmacy is an online pharmacy. They deliver within all of New York City, to my knowledge. I'm pretty sure I'm right. All of New York City. A van shows up at your apartment and they drop off the medicine and it is free. It's quick. I haven't heard anybody have anything bad to say. And actually, I have a patient whose daughter works at Alto Pharmacy. So I got to learn a little bit about the pharmacy itself. It's just another online pharmacy, but they seem to be pretty efficient. So in New York, New York City, that's the way to do it. And any doctor can write that prescription, but it's got to be to Alto. Uh, that's New York City set the contract up. Outside of New York, different, uh, it, it may be much easier to get in some counties, but it goes county by county, state by state. But what I've heard is you can go to CVS in New Jersey, but you need to have a prescription from a doctor. So your doctor has to write the prescription to a pharmacy that has it in stock. Great, right. and, and Dr. Miller, can you also just speak to, we, we often hear from, from patients that they weren't aware about maybe some of the time limitations that you have to get this, these type of antibody treatments if you are exposed or diagnosed with COVID. So can you talk about, you know, once you get diagnosed, you know, should be, what are the steps? Should you be reaching out to your rheumatologist immediately, go to the ER? What are some of the steps that patients should take? 
Yeah, and I'll just mention, I know everybody on this call has a rheumatologist, but you'll probably, you may also have other doctors, including a primary care doctor. These people can certainly evaluate and they've been seeing a lot of patients with COVID too. So if it's hard to find the rheumatologist, you certainly have other people to call. Um, you can think about Paxlovid. It's a, it's, a, it's a medicine that affects the virus, right? So there's no point in starting it 10 days later. Uh, when most of the virus is, is probably gone. You want to start as soon as you can after um, you find out that you're infected. Uh, so usually we say within the first five days uh, after onset of infection. So I would say if you find out um, or you think that you've got COVID or your test is positive for COVID and you've got symptoms, uh, you try to get it that day. You don't wait over the weekend. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia. She's gonna keep uh, with some of the additional questions that came in the chat box. Um, there's, there's a question here, and um, it's really in relation to people that have very serious reactions to vaccines. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what can we do for those patients? Like what's being done currently? Right, so I think the studies that have been pretty consistent show that, that you know, one in 50,000, one in 100,000 people have pretty bad allergies and you know anaphylaxis to these vaccines and uh, really shouldn't get more vaccine. Those people can um, are, are, are among the groups of people that can get Evusheld uh, is be, you, you, because you can't you medically can't get the vaccine and you, you want to be protected. So that's one thing to do. Um, but there's not so much besides that that we know prevents infection. We know that uh, social distancing and masks and all those good things do. But in terms of medicines, that's about it. That's the medicine that's out there to prevent uh, infection that's not a vaccine. So the other questions that are coming through and they had, there's a couple of similar questions related to um, titers and antibodies, whether you need to actually get your titers drawn uh, post-vaccination or um, you know, pre-vaccination, just in general, do you use that as a monitoring tool in order to get a booster or things like that? Yeah, that's a good one. So I know um, a lot of, at least for the HSS people on the call, I know your rheumatologists, right? And some of them, there's been disagreement among them and with me about the need to get your titers drawn. It's probably true that if you have a, it's probably, probably true that if you have a high titer, uh, you're more protected. And if you have a low titer, you're less protected. But there has been, um, a lot of controversy about it. Not everybody, it, it, I showed you about T cells, right? And T cells are not measured by the titers, but T cells turn out to be very important for vaccine immunity. So even if your titer is low, maybe you're perfectly well protected against COVID. Also, sometimes those antibodies are measured and they're high, but they're not actually neutralizing antibodies. Those are antibodies that actually work against the virus. Though testing whether antibodies are actually good quality or not, you need a special lab and we don't do that at Quest or LabCorp or in our lab, it just needs to be a research lab looking at neutralizing antibodies. So just because you have a high titer doesn't mean the vaccine works. So what I've been telling your rheumatologists and, and people have been arguing about this since day one, don't check because I don't trust the result. What you should know is to get the vaccine. And as I said, people with, um, with a lot of immune issues because of the medicines they're taking or because of their lupus or because of whatever other problems you can talk about getting Evusheld. Stick with the masks, stick with the social distancing and we watch how people do. But I am not a big fan of checking those antibodies. Lots of your rheumatologists disagree with me. They have their reasons, but I've, I've said my piece. I think there's another question. I think uh, probably a lot of people on the line, they, they're living in households with either their spouses or family members. And, um, you know, as far as getting that second booster, would you wish, would you actually push your spouse or someone else in your household to get that second booster? Yeah. Is there yeah. Yes. That's, that's one good reason to get the booster is to protect the other people in your household. You want to do what you can, not just for yourself, but for people who have risks of getting even sicker. Uh, so that's a good point. We'll look at the other questions to see if we missed anything. Yeah, Trisha, I see one that came in. Um, Dr. Miller, of the options for boosters, do you recommend the Moderna over the Pfizer or vice versa? 
Uh, that's a, so I, I mentioned I prefer one of them over the J and J, like either of them more than the J and J. Um, right now, if I had to choose, somebody was coming after me, I'd say Moderna, but only by that much based on like just a little bit. They're both fantastic. They both really work. There is a little bit of data that's interesting about how you maybe should cross, right? It's like, you know, if, if, you've, if you've had two chocolate chip cookies, maybe try an oatmeal raisin. Um, and, and, and that that actually induces, having both mRNA vaccines induces more antibody than just having the Pfizer or the Moderna all three times or all four times. So a mix and match seems to be safe. I don't think we know for sure that it's more effective, but there's some clue that maybe switching between them may be effective. So I'm okay with you wanting to try it, and I think it's safe to do that. Um, but no, between Moderna and Pfizer, they're pretty equivalent. Great, thank you. And someone also, I don't know, Trisha, if you saw this question about uh, what are your thoughts about taking Safnello in this COVID environment? Or should you take Safnello in this COVID environment? Yeah, and so I'm going to do one thing, which is embarrassing, but I'm going to find out what Safnello is. It's a brand name for, oh, um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you that I don't know that brand name. And the answer to that one is, it looks like, is it a rituxan? It looks like it's a rituxan. No, it's not. I think it's gonna be okay. It's an interferon receptor uh, antagonist. And I think you need to talk to your rheumatologist about that one. I don't know that medicine specifically. Good yeah, there's a couple of um, other medication questions. So yeah. I think, um, so there's also um, about what are the COVID risks with Benlista or, or Zathoprine, which actually can be used for RA and it's also used for transplant patients. So I, so that's actually one of the other. What questions. was the, What was the, the, the last one you said? The it's um. What are the COVID risks associated with like Benlista because that's a B cell, yeah. and then Xanthoprene, which oh I, 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 is it, so yeah, I, so that's a good question. Benlista probably okay, certainly better than rituxan, um, and azathioprine um, may actually be one of the medicines that's associated. It's worse than, as there were some studies that showed that, that people on azathioprine that were, got a little sicker than people on TNF inhibitors, but not as sick as people with on rituxan. So it's sort of along, along the lines, but yeah, probably not, uh, not great because you're really affecting your immune system. It, it, it's given to people who really need that for their lupus. The problem here though is, and, and I know you guys struggle with this all the time, is that if you stop these medicines, and this is, I'll just want to say, this may be the most important thing I'm saying, if you stop these medicines, it's big trouble too, um, because you need them for your lupus and, and untreated lupus is, you know, can be deadly and it's very harmful. And if you're in the middle of a terrible flare and you get COVID, you can get very sick. So making these decisions about medicines shouldn't be like, oh my God, I could get COVID. I'm going to stop my azathioprine. No, 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 no. You really need to think about the risks and benefits with your rheumatologist. Think about what the what is the safe part of your medication regimen that you could stop, and what do you not dare to stop because of the lupus. And it's a really tricky question. There's probably uh, I can get to. I think we have time for another two questions. I think. So, I'm, here. I'm good. Okay, so um, I think um, one of the questions that came in is about if you're living in a household and everyone is vaccinated and boosted would you suggest they would wear masks or social distance within your own household? I don't know what your family is like, but it's not happening in mine. It's, it's people have to live and, uh, and eat together and, and uh, you know, it's, it, I don't know how you'd get that, have that happen. But what you need to do is those people who live in your household, you need to remind them uh, when they go outside, if they're in the bus, they have to wear a mask. And if they're in the, you know, the mail room of, the, of your apartment building and it's really crowded, they can wait till it empties out to get the mail and stuff like that. You know, do, do reasonable things and remember and be considerate to your own impaired immune system. But yeah, it is pretty hard to wear a mask uh, at home, you know, sitting around. You're at home and, and, and I think people, uh, it would be hard to enforce that. So oh, um, I think this is a good question. Do blood thinners interfere with any of the vaccines or boosters that you're aware of? No, uh, they don't. But they, if they do interfere, you have to be careful with Paxlovid and those blood thinners. 
Great, thank you. I think just um, we have about time for one more question and just to wrap up um, our wonderful session today, you know, besides getting fully boosted, what are some of the best practices or some final words that you can share with lupus patients so that they can be safe, um, whether indoors or outdoors? Um, so we talked about boosting. We talked about some of the patients who might um, might qual could qualify and talk about Evushel. We talked about keeping your lupus under control, not with too much medicine, but with just enough uh, so, that, so that you're not on extra immunosuppression. I think the important things we've talked about are not going into you know, too crowded, too ridiculous social situations. And everybody has their own ability to do that. Some have to go to work and they have some tough decisions ahead of them. Some can't live without a block party and they've got to go to that block party. And we're all human and we all make these, you know, decisions on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So figuring out what you're comfortable with in terms of risk and sticking to that decision. Um, wearing a mask where you can, they work. And actually, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the less comfortable the mask, talking about N95s and such, the better they work. That's, that's the truth. So cloth masks don't work quite as well. Paper surgical masks work a little better and N95 is the best. I think you guys know all of what I just said. You know it perfectly well and I'm just saying it again. It's been frustrating. We're gonna make it through this. Hopefully this will all go away. But in the meantime, you've all been fighting to stay as healthy as possible. You've made it here. Uh, we're gonna keep on making it. And um, it's so nice. I'm, I wanna thank you guys for listening. And I thank you for the invitation. And um, if there are more questions that come up, I'm happy to help answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. We really appreciate uh, the time you spent with us this afternoon and your thoughtful presentation. Um, if you have any additional questions, we encourage you to submit them in the chat box. We can work with Dr. Miller to get answers to those questions. Um, you can also submit them in our evaluation link, which is going to be embedded into the chat box. Uh, we really encourage you to please spend a few minutes completing this evaluation. It really helps us to inform future, future programs. So before we, we wrap up, I'd also like to invite you all to our upcoming programs in honor of Lupus Awareness Month. We have a diverse lineup of programs this year. Uh, and next Monday on May 9th, we will be having a certified meditation instructor join us uh, to promote some meditation and relaxation. On May 12th, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Henry Lee, We'll be answering all questions related to lupus and the skin. On May 17th, we're going to be joined by Dr. Ruth Fernandez Ruiz, who will be discussing lupus and mental health. And this program will actually be conducted in Spanish. And last but not least, on May 24th, we're excited to partner with the Lupus Foundation of America and the Lupus and APS Center of Excellence at HSS on an interactive presentation titled Navigating Bias in the Healthcare Setting. So we hope that all of you can join us for our upcoming programs. Registration links have been placed in the chat box if you'd like to register for these programs. Again, we thank you all for your participation today and we hope you have a happy, happy Lupus Awareness Month. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon, everyone.